All right, everyone, welcome from Boston University. My name is Kaya Shilvin, and I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Europe. And today, I'm delighted to be able to welcome Terrell Starr and Deborah Douglas, my colleague from Boston University. And if you'll uh, let me for a moment, I'd like to give them a proper introduction. Terrell Jermaine Starr is an independent journalist based in Kyiv, Ukraine, and is currently in Ukraine covering the Russian invasion. He's the founder and host of the Black Diplomats podcast, where he covers geopolitical issues, especially around Eastern Europe and Eurasia. He's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center, and he writes for the Rolling Stone. He previously wrote for The Root and Foxtrot Alpha, a blog that focuses on the military, technology, and policy. With him today, we have my distinguished colleague, Deborah Douglas, who is co-editor-in-chief of The Emancipator, a collaboration between Boston University and the Boston Globe that centers critical voices, debates, and evidence-based opinion to reframe the national conversation on racial equity and hasten racially just outcomes. She has served as the Eugene Pulliam Distinguished Visiting Professor of Journalism at DePaul University and is the author of the U.S. Civil Rights Trail, A Traveler's Guide to the People, Places, and Events that Made the Movement. So again, I'm delighted to have this conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you. Terrell, I'm so happy to be here with you. I've been um, watching your journey unfold on Twitter and reading stories about you, and I feel like I'm personally inv invested, um, not only in this world event, but in you as a person. Um, as I was watching your Twitter feed and clutching my chest, um, I was watching the lead up to the war, hoping that it didn't, it didn't happen. And I, I wanted to know immediately, why didn't you leave? Thank you very much, uh, Deborah, for having me. Uh, and Kaija, I pray that I said, I pronounced your name correctly. Um, and to the participants to Boston University for taking time to uh, first of all, thinking that I'm somebody that is worthy enough of uh, taking people's time. Anytime someone invites you to speak, I think that we all should take that as a big thank you and, and a sign of gratitude because there are many people that could have been chosen to speak, but I was chosen. And I think that for those of us who are fortunate enough to be asked to speak on any subject, the first thing that should come out of our mouths is thank you. And to you, Deborah, for feeling that I'm somebody who um, is worthy of interviewing because there are many people who I'm sure if you were asked um, if you could interview them, you wouldn't say yes to all of them. So uh, so, so thank you very much. I, I consider that an honor. And so I, I going back to your question about why I decided to stay, there are several reasons. One, the first, I am a, I'm a part-time resident here in Ukraine. And so this is a part-time home. And whether it's my original hometown of Detroit, Michigan, my new home in New York in New York City and then my home away from home here in Ukraine I don't like being running away from a place that I firmly established um, as my home where I pay you know whether I pay taxes or not you know I, I need you know no one runs me away from anything but also I have friends here I have an emotional commitment to Ukraine and I felt like I was kind of leaving my friends so emotionally I couldn't do it I felt like deep down in my heart, there was something positive that I could bring while I'm here. I first was introduced to this part of the world through the United, through United Methodist Church programs. They were non-proselytizing programs, but they were programs that were uh, nonetheless funded by the church. But even though I wasn't a proselytizing participant, my introduction to foreign affairs was through faith not necessarily through the Washington think tank political science apparatus. Uh, so I had a faith bound mission to be here. And I'll add by that to say that it helps me to understand global affairs because uh, whether it be international affairs, whether it be political science, history, you name the disciplines, they don't have the requisite pedagogies to explain what's happening here and theology to me is another component that's severely undervalued in understanding foreign affairs, but that plays a role into why I stayed. And finally, I am a journalist and I, can't, I stayed here to report. And interestingly enough, I was reporting live 
with my selfie stick and my iPhone uh, from the ground on many occasions. Surprisingly, out of the dozens of times that I re that I broadcast live, I only lost the signal twice. Oh, so wow. but, yeah, yeah, only twice with the regular old internet. So I was very lucky to do that. But that, but those were the reasons why I decided to stay here. Yeah, I want to know more about that faith-based door and um, juxtapose that against the, the think tank door uh, to uh, foreign affairs reporting and diplomacy, as you described in a lot of your writings. Uh, uh, was that think tank door open to you? And what were you doing in your life at the time when you decided to walk through the faith door? The first time I decided to walk through the faith door in regards to foreign, you know, in regards to foreign policy was when I was 18 years old and I, my first foreign, for, first international trip was to Senegal. Mm -hmm. And I was there for eight days. Again, the church paid for it, but we were just there functioning as tourists, just looking at the work that the Methodist church did. And so I just enjoy being on airplanes. Most people don't like being on long flights they don't like the comfort of the seats and what has become true what was true then is true now i can stick through anything now there are uh, there are explosions well tonight has been really quiet so usually around this time you could possibly hear explosions in the background because i'm right next to my window you don't hear them now yeah. and but usually you hear explosions and i've gotten used to it and so it's just a common thing, but I could sleep through anything. But I just love the experience of being on a plane, knowing that I'm going to go across the water. That, that was something that just brings me joy. And I knew that I wanted to do it. So it was a bug in me that I just could not shake, did not want to shake. But my second trip was uh, my junior foreign affair, my foreign, my study, my abroad trip was to Haiti in 2000, spring of 2001. And there was there where I learned about um, the you know the country of Haiti <clears throat> and its resistance history. Didn't know what the word colonialism meant, but I saw it. Colonialism, imperialism, including by the United States. I I had the experience of it, even though I didn't know what the terminology was. And my last did my that summer in two thousand one went to Russia. I was a volunteer in a Russian orphanage. From there, the Peace Corps, you know, which was not, which is not affiliated with the church at all as US government. But my point is that for most people, I mean, this goes to your second question, your second part about the think tanks. Mm -hmm. My, I think with black people was interesting is that uh, where uh, one, I went to a historically black college, which explains the Methodist part because Philander Smith College in Little Rock, Arkansas is affiliated with the United Methodist Church. It's a smaller HBCU. And it's one of those places where if you shine just a little bit, you have people who are running to you yes. to give you opportunities. And so I think I am very thankful for my HBCU experience for putting that seed in me. And so, um, and even to Russia, the people who invite asked me to go, who, who really encouraged me to go abroad, particularly to Russia and Eastern Europe to give it a try, were black people. Hmm. I didn't have a, yeah, they, they were all black people who had never really traveled that much. <laughs> so, okay. and, and, and the interesting dynamic about it was that I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Yeah, where, was that? Yeah, on the west west side. Um, okay. Yeah, west side. So I, um, Northwestern High School. I went all, all my pub, all the public schooling in uh, Detroit. Biddle, Biddle uh, Elementary School, Weber Middle School. Yeah, I was a Coleman A Young Scholar when I graduated my senior year. So it was all things Detroit, uh, largest black city in America. And quite frankly, I had no interest in being around anyone who wasn't black. And <laughs> Yeah, I just, I just didn't, and, you know, and, and, um, you know, it just didn't interest me. And so, um, so when I went to Russia in the summer before my junior, you know, before my junior, before my senior year, the application asks you, where would you like to go if you, you know, um, if we accept you, because we'll pay for everything. I chose all the black places. When I was accepted, it said Russia, and I called my godmother and said, I don't want to do this. 
And she said, your mother's black, your daddy's black. And so she went down the whole laundry list about my black existence and admonished me to go. And so, um, and so my point to that is much of the way throughout the, and I'm telling you this background story is that much of how I view this part of the world comes from my black experience. Okay. Because I understand, you know, white supremacy. I understand racism as a black person. Right. But when I step into these spaces of, you know, because, you know, and we, and being black in America, we talk about police brutality and all these other subjects. And so we're used to being the abused. And so we look at the imperial constructs of the United States. What I did was when I started coming to this part of the world, um, and once I got past my own ignorance and my own fears, which are primarily what motivated me or discouraged me from not really wanting to come, I was able to understand the, the very vast complexity of the humanity of these people, particularly Ukrainians and people in the South Caucasus, the Georgians, for example, who in America, we would all consider them to be white. But over here, that's not the way that it plays out at all. They have their own constructs of ethnicity and their own hierarchies of discrimination where Russia with its own imperial and its racist construct views itself as, hey, the, the, the superior white per se or the superior Slav, you know? And, yeah, how do you see that play out? Well, for example, if you look at, so going directly to your point um, and I'll get around to the thing, thing part, but yeah, get, get, getting, getting to that point, leading up to this war, you have a uh, leading up to this war that Russia, well, this invasion, right, that, that Russia is conducting. Um, the way that Putin talks about Ukrainians, they're not a real nation. Uh, they're not a real people. Um, he's, and, and one of the things that he said that wasn't really covered extensively in Western media was how he talked about Crimean Tatars which is a Turkic group in the Crimea, which were, you know, um, you know, Crimea, which was illegally annexed in 2014. He referred to these people as Islamic terrorists. Ooh. Now, if an American politician were to use those same words, we would be considered them Islamophobic, racist, you name it. And so I bring that up to say that there's a centuries long history of discrimination against ethnic minorities here. And the way that Russia became a country was through mass genocide. You know, in S Siberia, for example, that, you know, which is this vast um, Eastern territory that's, that's, you know, when we think about Russia, we think about coal, we think about Lake Baikal, you know, for example, that was not Russian land. Those were indigenous people that, <clears throat> that ethnic Russians through their various governments um, committed genocide against. And so they're no different than American early settlers who killed off our, our native populations in the United States. So when you think about the imperial construct, America and Russia, they're peers. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't like to talk about that. Well, I think that white media constructs um, don't like, don't, do not allow space for self-critique of their of our own institutions because those institutions uphold them, which goes back to your think, you know, and so, and this goes back to your think think um, part of the of the first question. Yeah. So, I'm at the Atlantic Council, <clears throat> and I'm going to give you a more um, an edited version of this. Is and my, when when they reached out to me and said we would like you to be a non-resident fellow, I said, why do they want my black behind there? Mm -hmm. You know, because if you look at my Twitter, I don't, I you know, there's no, I don't really um, tweet in a way that's quote unquote safe or politically correct, because I spent much of my time in black media or black targeted media where I did not need to censor myself for white people. Right. And I have a very intimate story about that with mental health, which we could talk about later at your, you know, at the time that you're choosing, but I had a very mental health component to why I don't censor myself for white people. 
And so I'm saying, why does the Atlanta Council want me? And I was suspicious Okay. at first. But the thing about it is that <clears throat> no, the think tank doors were not open for me, nor were the jobs for foreign affairs reporting when I finished my Fulbright in 2010. Because what I found and what I've later been told is that, you know, those roles are extremely white. They're very, you know, kind of uh, Ivy League-ish. Yes. And it's one of those things where do you know someone who knows someone who knows someone? And so I just quit. I didn't, I stopped pursuing doing anything in foreign affairs reporting and I worked in black media because again, those were the people, black people who, who, who trusted me and believed in me that I could be a journalist. And so, yeah, I, that, yeah. that makes a lot of, it just, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the black media has been uh, ensconced in, in the advocacy lane for a long time. Um, it reminds me of Alyssa Richardson's book, Bearing Witness While Black. And so you have to bear witness and an advocate at the same time. Yeah. And that's not something that, that operates under the construct of, of objective mainstream media. It doesn't because advocacy is the antithesis of white objectivity. And I've always called journal, American journalism the white man's diary. Ooh. Because of that. Okay. And so, and be, because of that. Because ultimately, here's the bottom line. Being a journalist is, is one of the professions that is widely popular, but does not require a license. We're not like doctors or dentists or veterinarians, for example, therapists, even in graduate schools. Uh, if you're conducting research and interviewing people, you have to go through some particular board structure within the graduate school to do it. Journalism is the only school that's exempt from that. And so we, and ultimately journalists, journalists are ultimately storytellers, but there's a general consensus of who could tell those stories and where. And the thing that really makes you a journalist um, over the years, non-officially is where you work. Mm -hmm. But in reality, what, in, what, what empowers you to report is the constitution. And many people don't know that, right? That's a constitutional right. Anybody with a cell phone can say, and, and if they take the work, now I'm not saying that anybody could be a journalist. What I'm saying is that people can go out and, and with the right skills can, be, can, can commit an act of journalism, right? And so, and that's a constitutional right. And it's about who gives you credibility. Yeah. You know, it's just traditionally it's been about where you work because I work for myself and I've established my credibility by myself. And so, the problem with the think tank spaces, which are highly white, you know, they are spaces that incubate what I call an incestuous relationship with power that harms people at the bottom. And what, and, and if you're in those situations, you have to make a critical choice about how much of your voice do you want to suppress in order to work in those systems. That's just the reality of it. And I got a taste of it and I decided that early on that I wasn't interested in it because mentally I could not take it. Now there are people, because I speak with plenty of people who make really good money, but you get them out of a bar during happy hour and they'll pour their heart out about all their struggles. Yeah. Now here's the thing, they're able to get mortgages, they're able to you know, put their children in private school, that's fine, right? I just knew that that was not a healthy choice for me. And ironically, I um, went through my various media um, journey and we could talk about that, but ultimately I'm here right now in Ukraine with 100% support from the people. And because they respect me and my work and my voice and my advocacy. And so it's just come full circle that the only person who I need to seek validation from was myself. And once people saw that in me, they invested in it. I think that's beautiful. And I just appreciate the fact that you figured this out uh, for yourself early on, unlike a lot of us. 
And I just wanted to mention that the press is the only profession mentioned in the Constitution. So there's that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I wanted to add to that, when you, when you say those of us who, who got on to it, I have to tell you that one of the things that saved me was, I don't, and, and this is important, I'm not bragging, but I, I don't have any college debt. Um, it's more of a testimony than anything else. So I don't even know how much my, my schooling costs. I have two master's degrees from the University of Illinois and, I have a, and my education at Philander. I never paid for it. So um, my point is that I was able to be free and kind of go how I want. I have no children. I have no wife. I've never been married. I don't have a girlfriend. I don't mind having one eventually. But my point is that I don't have anything that um, I don't have any, you know, and so I don't, and then too, I don't have any, I have, I have no debt. And so I didn't have to tie myself down to a job and work in these structures I did not like. Yeah. So that yeah. makes a world of difference. And I just want to, and I think that's important to um, let people know about because in this, you know, in this profession, there are a whole lot of people. And by the way, I'm just, I'm just going to keep it real and talk to people about my conversations and what people really don't tell folks is that okay. so much of your comfort relies on the person that you marry. It relies mm -hmm. on how much you, you know, how much money you're into, like all these things, you know, and, and your parents, um, what they give to you, all of that stuff is important in determining what type of choices you're going to make. And because I had so many things financially in my favor, I, hey, listen, I grew up dirt poor, um, but again, I didn't have any debt, but that informs what you will accept and the challenges and the abuse that you choose to take. Yeah, I got you. So you mentioned earlier uh, the fact that it's pretty quiet now, but I've seen posts where you say that you've um, been surrounded by uh, missile fire and you've learned how to duck from shrapnel. So just take us into a day in your life um, of being embedded with, with soldiers and going from checkpoint to checkpoint. How are you staying safe? How are the people of Ukraine staying safe? Okay, that's a good question. So early on in the war, um, what the soldiers that you saw me with were, excuse me, volunteer soldiers that were part of what's known as a territorial um, defense, you know, territorial defense units. Mm -hmm. And these are volunteers. And so I was not embedded with the regular army. It takes, a, it takes it's a somewhat of a lengthy, excuse me, process to be embedded with the military there. I'm still working on that actually. So I, I went in with some volunteers and it was a bit easier. And basically these are people who are not really trained, especially they have different types of military experience. They're not a part of the official army, even though they're governed by them. And so I spent a few nights with them at a checkpoint. And so their job is primarily to check cars coming and going throughout the city. And so imagine I was with them early on, and one of those people were, were was a good, you know, is a very good friend of mine. You know, it's Andre um, Koroninko, um, and he, um, I'm, and, and many people actually saw me with him. You know, kind of driving refugees to the border, and so, and that which is something I'm still doing now. I'm actually taking two elderly elderly women uh, to Poland on Thursday, and we could talk about that. You know, but it, but at any rate, um, so what is that like? you hope that you don't see any violence, which I did. Um, my very first day with them, I saw, you know, I saw this unit shoot someone to death. Oh. Um, and well, it, but the larger issue is that, um, according, you know, um, based on what I'm understanding right now from officials is that these people were likely saboteurs. Ooh. You know, and so they, you know, and so the arm, so so the military has, um, you know, taken out multiple people who are uh, saboteurs, Russian saboteurs, and mm -hmm. you know, and so I wouldn't see people get shot up in the car, you know, who refuse to stop at a checkpoint, and so, and usually ninety nine percent of the time, you show your documents, you slow up, and you just go through, but they're actually pretty dangerous moments because anything can happen. And also, because it's a war, you have to remember, this is a city the size of Chicago. And just imagine just in, you know, Boston or New York or Detroit, you're in a, it becomes militarized and you see soldiers at checkpoints and you're not used to it. 
And so some people, they could just freak out. Mm. And so again, just as a journalist, you know, you're looking at this and you're dealing with people who are not professional army, <laughs> you know? And so I saw one guy firing warning shots into the air, which it was unnecessary. Okay. It was unnecessary. He didn't have to do it, but you're dealing, but that's what happens when you're dealing with people who aren't necessarily professional army or military. Right. And so you're just praying, please do not shoot these people, you know, and you could tell that the people were just freaked out by seeing people with guns and M16, you know, like in, with, with AK-47s. And so you can walk around, go to a cafe and see somebody, you know, on their Apple laptop with a, with, with an automatic rifle swung over their shoulder. It's just a normal thing now. But um, anyway, after that shooting, this, the following day, I was, um, you know, basically I was just there interviewing the folks, you know, and you talk to them, one, people, well, one person said that they're a museum director, another person saying that, they, hey, they work in, you know, environmental justice, whatever, right? You know, and so they, and so because if you're a man between the age, ages of 18 and 60, you can't leave the country if you're a Ukrainian, right? And so these people are staying and they're building up a camaraderie with each other. Um, but the second day I'm with Andre, you know, and so we're basically preparing to spend, you know, spend the night at this checkpoint. And we were driving there and he said, hey man, I forgot something. We already arrived, so we drove back then came back and then about 200 meters ahead of us we saw these two missiles like coming down and striking yeah. the same location where we were <laughs> that's so scary I'm, you know and so literally we saw and so the smoke came up and everything so like it, yeah it was i mean we saw the missiles and so we we just missed it like 200 meters and so i you know and i think some people saw the video uh that i captured you know, it, you know, and the aftermath of that, and it was actually really, it was used in Ukrainian press uh, over the past, oh, during, you know, at the time. And right. so it, for me, I knew to be safe, but what the first thing that came into my mind, I need to capture this. Right. And so the thing about it is that you get familiar with people, they're used to you. And so you're not a stranger around them. Got it. So, so that's, so that's what it takes. And so what is, it's pretty much, this is the first time I've ever been in a war situation and you're either made for it or you're not. Well, let me put that, let me put it back. I don't think anybody's made to deal with the inhumanity of war. I would, I would, I would take that back and say, you either, it, once you either respond to it by learning how to be a journalist in that context or you don't. I you got know, it. It's not something that you could be trained to do. You either have it, it's something and I guess it's a good thing. Like it's like some people are built differently. Some people can't, some people say if they saw someone being shot or if they saw someone with shrapnel, like some people can't have, like some people, they can't work through that, but you have to. Yeah. And, 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 and so I learned during that point, I was able to do that. So that's just one, 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 ex couple of examples. I do want to come to your mental health example, but I want to ask a couple of questions about a couple of urgent considerations that have come up during this invasion. Um, <clears throat> early on, we saw reports about racism uh, in Ukraine's handling of evacuees, black and brown. And uh, Filippo Grandi, the head of the UN's refugee agency said that these acts of discrimination are unacceptable and we're using our many channels and resources to make sure that all people are protected equally. And he went on to say that the refugee experience comes with the same pain and sorrow, the same loss and anguish, the same relief at finding safety and trepidation of an uncertain future mm -hmm. experienced by everyone on the run. So what can you tell us about these reports? And also, have you observed any changes uh, in the treatment of black and brown evacuees? And I wanna know, you know, from the outside looking in, how do Ukrainians process reports about this kind of thing happening? No, well, thank you. That's a really good question. So, yeah, I mean, those stories you heard only on, yeah, they were true. And not only were they true, it wasn't surprising because the racism was already here. 
so what the what what you know really it it, it was you know it, it has been and so what tragedies like this do is it exacerbates problems that already existed there are a wide range of issues here you know we'll talk about the issue with disabilities people with disabilities with the elderly people in the next question but we're dealing specifically with race oh yes definitely racism it was already here and so the and so you we just saw an exacerbated version of it at this border and so I'm going to tell you another thing too is that I was in a I started off doing more military or conflict style reporting. Doing border stuff is kind of a different type of lane, you know, when you're dealing with migrate migrations and things like that, because I'm just situated differently. I mean, it's a difference between being embedded with somebody, you know, who has to, you know, who has to uh, in, in an armed, um, you know, people armed people at a checkpoint or or being embedded in the Ukrainian military versus dealing with refugees at a border. Right. You know, it's a different thing. And so I am being introduced to both of these things. Now, another important context in this is my passport being a black American. And the privilege in, in the quote unquote, in like the privileges that come with that when compared to somebody from the continent. Paint a picture right. for us of how that operates. It was really simple. I mean, you pull out your passport, you're an American, you're the big, you're the big brother that's protecting us from Russia, and you're going to be viewed differently versus if you are from the continent of Africa. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely I've spoken with Americans and who've been in different parts of Eastern Europe, Black Americans who've been in di different parts of Eastern Europe, and we all see the difference. And it may, and it may not be extreme racism, but it's subtle. Yeah. And some, you know, and so sometimes it's not necessary, you know, because America, you know, with, with the continent of Africa, you associate with poverty and all these other things, right? And with the stereotypically, without talking about the imperialism that, that created it, right? right. All right. Um, and, then, and then also with America, they're associated with prosperity and something that they aspire to. And so just without even the racial context, you're going, you know, there's going to be a kind of, oh man, you're American type of conversation, right? And so I don't deal with this type of stereotypical questions that somebody from the continent would, okay? That's just a fact. Now, when you're talking about the border specifically, the people who are prioritized at the border are Ukrainian women and children. So there's one line there. On the other side of the, in the other line are the foreigners, which are basically the black and brown people, people, folks who look like us, all right, like the both of us. Interestingly enough, the first family that I took across the border, and I took them across the border because my friend Andre is a Ukrainian man, he can't leave. Now I'm in the Ukrainian line and the border people are looking at me like, what are you doing in this line? I'm saying, hey, I'm escorting these people. And I also put up my American passport and that kind of gave me some, thing. you know, really it's kind of like you put up your passport, people tend to leave you alone, they do. Okay. Okay, and I'm not saying, and, and it's not correct, you know, in, re in regards to if you're gonna treat somebody who doesn't have my passport less than me, that's completely wrong. So I'm just giving you a complete version of what I observe, right? Now, right. interestingly enough, ahead of me was a brother from Ghana with this Ukrainian wife, you know, a white, you know, like white Ukrainian woman. And so basically, <laughs> I was able to stay in that line to get through because of my passport, he was able to get through because of his wife. So white privilege. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, and so these other people, um, and so I saw people like the way the border guards were talking was, um, you know, hey, you know, if you're a woman here. Africans and other people, blah, 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 over there, you know, and so they were rude to everybody, but I didn't like how this border guard was saying, oh, the Africans over here, blah, blah, blah. It's like, I just didn't like the way that, I didn't like the tone in this voice. So I, I saw, so, so, so if I were in that other line, listen, forget the other line, I felt offended, right? And so, so basically I'm talking to Meanwhile, I'm taking this family over because this family was under 
a bunker, you know, in, in a uh, shelter for three days. A mother, her nine-year-old twin daughters and the grandmother. And we had to drive two and a half days to get them to the border. Wow. All this time, because you have to go through all these checkpoints, all this time, I'm talking to our British guy named Shane, who's on the Slovak border, waiting for me to hand this family over to him. So we get to the, we get, we get past the, you know, we get past the border. Now I escort the family because the thing is they could have gone by themselves, but they didn't want me to leave them. Okay. Because they were scared and frightened. All right. So anyway, get past the border. Hand them over to uh, Shane, who is a black Brit. And so the moral of this story is that this white family depended on a black dude to get them across the border and depending on another black man to get them into safety in Slovakia and set them up and get their housing. So their lives, so this white family, right? Mind you, in the midst of all this racism <laughs> that people like us are experiencing, this white family was depending on, like, she, it took two black, not one. It'd be, it's already interesting that it's one, but two, yeah. two black people critically aided their way to safety. And so in regards to how the, um, the government dealt with this racism and the videos that we all saw, you know, several people spoke out against it, said it was wrong, it shouldn't have happened. Now, what's happening on the Polish side is that dozens of people are being detained once they get over, even if they have documents, right? Now, now what, and so, we're still, and that's, and the thing about this from a reporting standpoint, it's still complex to figure out because there are a lot of claims that are made and they sound plausible, but we don't have the exact details. So for example, the Independent published a report saying that several, like 50 um, African students were held in detention once they crossed into the board, uh, Polish border, even if they had documents, right? Now, again, being somebody who's just used to not, you know, I'm new to this, um, this migration stories. Right. I don't understand how the process works, but it doggone sure it doesn't make sense that they're being detained, right? And so, because they're, they're fleeing a war zone. But, um, but basically, you know, as a U.S. citizen, I can come and go into the EU without a problem. Right. I, I can I, I can go without a problem to the EU, right? Whereas with the um, where if, if you don't have that US passport, I don't know what the paperwork process is like. So that's something that I need to work on, but the discrimination definitely happened. And it's quite frankly shameful. And as somebody who supports this country, it's like I can't help y'all on this, you know. You. Um, but 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 another thing too, I'll tell you is. This is creating a wide range of problems for people who use you, who came to Ukraine as asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. So what's happening? So, and I'll tell you this because there's a guy, because there are several, you know, black uh, black Ukrainian people who I, who I've actually helped. Okay. You know, and they're and they're my, you know, and and you know, uh, black Ukrainian refugees. I've helped a few of them um, get over. Now again, the only advantage that they have was that they're they were women and they're Ukrainian citizens, right? So they got preference to leave, right? Again, that's another twist. Like you got these black people who are able to leave without a problem, but they're black Ukrainians. Yeah. Um, and then, but this, but this guy, this African, this other, um, this Cameroonian guy, I'm trying to help, who's is disabled. Yeah, I wanted to know about that. Okay, yeah, you saw the Yeah, so basically, and that goes back to your question. So. He needs to be medevaced. The people I've been helping, I can just get a car and we can drive. This person I'm trying to help from Cameroon, he's been in the country for years and he doesn't have any documents. Mm. And so the so I've been, so you saw me like asking, hey, do you, can, you, can you help me? You know, you saw this, this tweet. And the problem is that even I've, I've spoken to people who say, well, we have a vehicle. I'm like, uh-uh, well, he needs an ambulance. Mm. You know, and then the next thing is, even if we get them across a border, I can't in good faith get them across the border until I figure out how his documents are being taken care of. 
Hmm. Because that's a lot. A lot, huh? that's a lot of responsibility. That's what I'm saying. I mean, it's kind of like, it's one of those things like you need your freedom papers in all parts of the world. And so you are, so basically I came over here, you know, I wasn't, ex, you know, I, I'm doing it and I love it. But then the more you help, the more of these issues that you're running into and you realize and understand why there are people who do this for a living and they get paid for it. Right. Right. And so basically um, I can't in good faith have this guy go across the border. I help him get across and put them into the hands of a border per border guard that's going to put them in a jail that's going to be that's going to give them even more problems than they were trying to escape. Yeah. So 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 you're, but anyway, I'll close out by saying that so many people come to Ukraine seeking refugee status in Western Europe. Ukraine is a stopover. But what happened with this war? is that it just threw a monkey wrench in everything because no, none of the systems, none of the government entities are working like they're supposed to because they're prioritizing uh, this war and fighting Putin. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're going to see the exacerbation of racism mm -hmm. and you're going to see people who, like this guy I'm trying to help, get lost in between the cracks. Got it. So you've been candid about the real-time racism on the ground. You've even talked about your own personal experiences with racism in Ukraine, um, specifically in searching for an apartment um, when you first uh, got there mm -hmm. and being profiled. Um, and yet you profess your love for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. And so I'm wondering, where does that come from? And how does growing up in the United States inform um, your love and embrace of this country? My love and embrace for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because I think that it's I think to be a to black to be a black person in America and to love, to profess love for what your country can be, it's almost an irrational concept. Right. And because we think about the abuse that we as Black people have experienced here. And the fact that when you think about the major legislation that's been passed in America, you think about the Civil Rights Act, you think Voter Rights Act, et cetera, you know, mid 1960s. And then, of course, it takes years for them to be active. So just hypothetically say 1970. And you can really say that as, as a people, We've only experienced full, you know, the, the rights that we experience right now, we've only been experiencing the rights that we have right now for a little more than 50 years. Yeah, and they're taking those back. And they're but, let's, but think about that, right? Think about it. 50 mm -hmm. years, that's your grandmother. So, just, you, so you have a grandmother who lived in a world where, she, where we did not have the rights that we have. Think about that. And so for me, Coming from Detroit, growing up with a Black power mayor in Coleman A. Young. Yep. Black HBCU tradition, going down to the South in Arkansas, where the Little Rock Nine, right? The whole history of that. Yes. For me to say, I am going to take my Black behind out of an environment that is racist and white supremacist, but an environment and race and, and white supremacy that I know to a global white supremacy that I don't know is an act of faith that has very little to do with me. Okay. Right. Uh, so, yeah. so, so that's what I'm saying. So like it had nothing to do with, oh, I saw, I don't know, name some famous diplomat or in this person occurred, uh, none of that. <laughs> okay. N none of that at all. It, it was all faith-based. And, and, and again, you don't hear a lot of journalists or a lot of people in these types of conversations talk about faith, but that's just my story because without it, I would not be here in us. And I think, you know, what people don't know about me also is that I cover two US elections. So okay. yes, I'm covering foreign policy, but I also understand domestic politics, which qualifies me even more yeah. So, you know, to talk about what's happening here and doing a comparison between what democracies are and aren't, because I understand my democracy just as much as I can understand democracy in Russia and here. Now, interestingly enough, 
I think that many white journalists who cover foreign policy don't understand the totality of American injustice and American democracy at all because they seek the because they have the most benefits of it. Got it. Yeah. You know, so 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 I'll finish by saying that I took on um but but when I the main thing is um give you a bridge version of the story. When I first came here to Ukraine, I I'm a planner. So months in advance, I plan on my real estate agents. I see it when I get into Ukraine on the same day, I want an apartment. I got three months rent and we can just sell it there. As soon as I find an apartment, I like it. I get off the plane, go to the center of town. This Ukrainian guy reaches his hand out and says, hello, Terrell, I'm happy you're here. Your skin color is causing us a lot of problems. <laughs> and he kind of giggled. Okay. And, and it's, I mean, it's funny. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, he just said it all in one sentence. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> um, and so the problem is that they were selling me as an American with three months rent. But as soon as they asked, hey, well, is he a black American? He, they said no. And they say uninteresting, which is why they couldn't have it. So, which is why they didn't have an apartment for me. So I literally went to six or seven apartments. And people said they wouldn't rent to me because I'm black. I mean, in America, I could sue these people. Right. It doesn't work like that in Ukraine. And so I ended up finding somebody who was okay with me and um, and I got it. But my po the point, the moral of the story, which gets back to your central question about why do I support this country? The reality is that there is nowhere in the world that America can escape white supremacy. And for that story that I just told you, there are a number of stories where black people's homes have been under appraised, where black people don't get mortgages because of their race and it's all documented. And so you can't escape it. And so I felt like what has been helping me in Ukraine is that I've been able to develop an analysis where in my own way, I feel like I'm being put here to tell Ukrainians and people around this, this, this region to move in an act of righteousness and understand that race, you know, the, 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 you, you may have one oppressor in Putin and you're running from this oppressor. Mm -hmm. But I'm always that voice that says, do not run to my country and become my oppressor. Okay. Because your whiteness makes you eligible to become it, whether you want to or not. And that has been my message. And I think that being in this region through all the ups and downs, has put me in squarely in the position to be that, to be that messenger. And those unfortunate stories are just part of that journey. Okay. Today you posted something on Twitter that demystified the thought bubble above my head, which is um, you, you talked about reports that many Russians um, support Putin and hold anti-Ukraine uh, colonial views. Mm -hmm. And so just from your perspective, growing up in Detroit and going to college down South, and then to the cornfields <laughs> at the University of Illinois. How have you seen colonial, colonial ideas play out in this particular scenario? Like, give us, like, help us connect the dots just to better yeah. prepare us to see what we need to see. Yeah, so I appreciate that. So when you think about redlining, this is something I'm gonna be writing my memoir uh, that's gonna be published, that's gonna re be released next fall. Um, so let's think about redlining, for example. In the United States, we all understand what that is, but like it's um, what when you think about colonialism, there are a number of things that happen. You know, there's a, you know we all associate with the continent of Africa, and you think about European uh, conquest, i.e., you know, there's a reason why the Senegalese speak French. There's a reason why the um, our Ghanaian brothers and sisters are speaking English. Uh, those are not their native tongues, <laughs> okay? And, and, and people who look like us, it's not ours, you know? And so we were brought over here. And so that's a part of it. It's a subjugation of the local languages and putting the oppressors above all um, and actually restricting and penalizing you for learning your own language, right? Because, if you know, language is culture. 
you take away a person's language, you take away their history, you take away their storytellers. Yes. That's what you do. That's the thing. Language is very powerful. You take away a language, you take away their history. You take away a people's history. And also with that, you kill them. Um, in many cases, you have, um, and, the, and the man's name is evading me right now. As a, he was a king of Belgium, as Leopold. Um, um, I forgot, um, I think it's, but anyway, um, the, the, whole, the moral to the story is that there are, there are massive genocides that are taking place across the continent of Africa. And, and all of it was for the purpose of, of domination, suppressing um, you know, the, lo the local peoples and subjecting them to your rule, stripping of their resources, right? Renaming their territories. All this happened, everything that happened on a continent of Africa from Western Europeans is precisely what the Russian, you know, Ru Ru you know, Russian czars have done to Ukraine. Made it illegal to learn the Ukrainian language. Ooh. Mass murdered them in, 19, in the 1930s with Holodomor, right? And also, in creating lies, you know, for example, saying that Russian, pe Russian speakers are at risk, even though that's not true. I speak Russian. I can go down the street, speak without a problem. No one has a problem speaking Russian. But also what's was, what also happens here in Ukraine, and um, I, I, I think people, many people would know Catherine the Great, yep. you know, who's ruled during the late 17, um, 1700s. And so there are a lot of uh, Hollywood movies that have been made of her, particularly with her um, her very liberal um, dating dating taste, for example, was part of it. And by the way, a lot of people don't know that she was not um, Russian; she was German. Um, but um, but basically, she was one of the main people who created a. Um, she was one of the main people who actually was responsible for taking large territories and land from Ukraine, leading the repopulations of it with ethnic Russians, and turning Ukraine to Pella settlement, which is a place where Jews were pushed into because, quote unquote, they were taking our jobs and these Jews were taking. Um, you know, they're, they're taking economic opportunities away from us, right? And we've heard those stories before, right? The stereotype about the Jews and the stereotypes about Black, you know, you know, about people who are any foreigners, right? You know, they're coming to take our jobs, right? And so this land, Ukraine, was a, was, was a blood land in a place where Ukrainians were murdered, were massacred, resources were stolen, taken to feed the rest of the, you know, the Soviet, in, in the case of the Soviet Union with Holodomor, but well before that. And so Ukraine, and many people would look at Ukrainians and Russians and say, why are these two white people fighting each other? Now, the rea and, and, and the reality of it is that they don't see themselves as equal among. Putin makes a lie to say that they're brothers, even though He's killing and deploying soldiers that are sexually assaulting and abusing and raping. And, and pardon me, I'm putting the trigger warnings out there for people because these are things that are actually happening in the news. Yeah, you know, I wanted movement. to know about that. Yeah, yeah. And so all, yeah, so all these things are happening and, he's, and Putin is doing all these things to his brothers, right? You know, killing their, you know, Ukraine, you know, his Ukrainian brother. So... And the reason why this is going back full circle to why this war is happening is that the Ukrainian has decided that they no longer want to be in this Ruski Mir, this Russian world. They do not want to be under the political auspices of Russia. And they've chosen to go down their own path. The reality of it is that Putin, who has always said that the Soviet Union's fall was a catastrophic you know, 20th century event, he needs Ukraine 
politically and economically in order to form his kind of Ruski Mir. Because Ukraine has the, you know, it has the grain, it has the fertile grounds, um, it has the territory, it has the, you know, it, it has the waterways, it has all these essential natural resources for Russia to thrive. And so what a colonizer does, instead of building up their own infrastructure, they'd steal someone else's because they have a military and they can. Or he thought he could in the case of Ukraine, but according to reports from the Ukrainian government, up, upwards of 16,000 so Russian soldiers have been killed and their bodies are spread all across these little towns um, an hour or so out of Kyiv. And even though that 16,000 may not be exactly accurate, most Western estimates put it at least at 12 to 13,000. And so, yeah. Wow. So thank you for, you answered my next question. So we've checked off empire, we've checked off global settler colonialism, we've checked off racial hierarchy, and we have validated that these are not things of the past. No. So, and you um, know, another thing, I want to add something. So, so the yeah. thing about, one of the things I want people to realize about empire, and going back to your original question about faith and what drives me here, um, I was not meant to be a traditional reporter. Okay. And the reason being is because, again, I have a faith-based approach to why I'm here. I'm here because of faith, not because I saw someone plot, you know, apply this craft and I wanted to emulate them. I had no particular role models to do what I'm doing. What I had was a calling, which is very different. And journalism is a tool through which I tell the stories that I feel that are important to tell. And the faith part comes in where when these traditional institutions that you try to in good faith take a part of, but you can't find a fit in, you have to go back to your calling and say that your calling will provide for you. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, and, and so that's the reason why I've been able to succeed comfortably independently. But going back to the point I want to close out with is that for those of you who want to be a journalist, I don't care what you want to be. We all, you know, and, and it comes down to what you understanding what your role is, right? My role is I am the black person with my very black experiences who can ironically, somebody who was kind of, who I felt was kind of rejected in these circles. Now I'm embraced by all of them. Funny how that um, happens. <laughs> huh? Funny how that happens. How funny, funny how that happens, right? And so all the networks that I didn't think I could be a part of, I have to turn down the interviews. And so I, spend much of my time in this field telling a lot of these Eastern Europeans who have these US aspirations, who look at uh, my country with endearment, that when they go over to America, they would be, they would stand a chance of avoiding the type of abuse by the state you know, the, um, that I've experienced. Like they, they will not have to deal with the type of abuse that I experienced. They will not have to deal with the type of prejudice that I experienced because they will be integrated into whiteness and they will have privileges that I will never have. And so when you think about the refugee crisis, mm -hmm. I am somebody who loves this country, Ukraine, but I'll tell a Ukrainian in a minute that even though you want your no-fly zone and all these other things, and you're not satisfied with the Western response, you are getting far better treatment than people who look like me and, and other countries ever would. That's powerful. And, and, and so, but the thing is that I say it, when I come in faith, I feel like there is, I feel like I have the language in a way that it, that I find the proper platforms to, to send that, you know, to really send that message into. And I have the, credibility of being here and supporting people. Like I said, I'm taking these two disabled grandmas 
mm-hmm. out of the country tomorrow. So I'll I'll do all that, but I'll also tell you your privilege and put your complaints in context because America may not be America may not be your oppressor, but it's someone else's. I got you. I want to. I have more questions, but I want to sure. make sure I room for um, our, the questions from our audience members. Um, we have this one question from Maurice Rabb. He says, hi, Terrell, so glad to see you in good health. Uh, we appreciate your discussion of ethnic, uh, actually, I think that means ethnic, ethnic racial oppression as a component of Russian imperialism. You've compared Russian and US historical genocide. Can you talk about the role of propaganda from, Rus- from Russia and from the US political right? Yeah, so let's get back to that question about refugees. By the way, me and uh, and um, um, me and brother Rab, we went to um, University of Illinois together, so we know each other very, very well. But anyway, um, with the refugee status, right? When you you initially asked me a question about how are Ukrainians taking it. The way that the Ukrainians initially took it, and I understand their point was they saw they thought that okay, the Russians are exact are going to be exacerbating this story for propaganda purposes because they have extreme racism in their own country, and their the, a lot of Ukrainians' fear was they would take this story, and it would be tied into this narrative of of, of Ukrainians being Nazis, right, mm-hmm. and so. Now, that was halfway true. The other half was your border patrol are treating our people like dirt. And you need to deal with that. So you can eliminate the propaganda, the reason you can eliminate the source of people exacerbating this unfortunate but true thing and turning it into a propaganda story and, 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 and turning it into something that is not, right? And so, when you think about propaganda, what has also been effective about Ukraine is that they say that Ukraine is run by Nazis. And y'all know a lot of people have heard this, um, this name Azov being thrown around a lot. And yeah, Ukraine does have a far right problem. Mm. The issue is that it's the pot calling the ghetto, calling, calling the kettle black. I said the ghetto black. <laughs> um, you know, the kettle black. <laughs> um, and what Putin is doing without, is that he literally has members of his Duma that are associated with far right groups that far outnumber what's happening in Ukraine. Ukraine U- Ukrainian far right groups politically get no more than 2% of the vote. Mm-hmm. That's it. And Russia their numbers are far higher. And there are far right groups, uh, battalions in Ukraine right now fighting on Russia's behalf. Multiple ones. You can point to Azov in Ukraine. You can point to several more in the case of Russia. That's verifiable fact. Now, going back to the issue um, with the far right, you know, from the US is that there is a very, uh, the reason why the far right or you have these conservative news outlets like Fox News and Carson Tucker, you know, Carlson Tucker, who is the chief U.S. propagandist for the Russian government, mm-hmm. is that they both have this very neo-imperial framework about how societies should exist. That's something that American white supremacists and Russian supremacists have in common. They both have this feeling that their societies are in decay. They feel that that globalization and Western influence are impacting the cultural norms, the traditional values of their societies. And some of the main people who are driving that are immigrants and Jews and generally people of color. 
And the exceptions in all of those groups are the sellouts hmm. who decide to peddle the white supremacist frameworks. One of the things that people often hear me say is that you don't have to be white to aid and abet white supremacy. Right. You don't have to be white to aid and abet white supremacy. So you so those are the exceptions per se in that you know in, in these categories. So what they have in so so when you look at Trump, for example, and his kind of um kowtowing to Putin, there is a lack of moral uh of, of a moral compass, right? right? Because when you look at Putin, for example, Putin in the second, you know, he had two wars with Chechnya. And the second one, he just bombed the, he just bombed Chechnya to death. Just bombed it, just indiscriminately. Used banned weapons in order to bomb those people into submission. He tried to do it in Kyiv, but the problem is that we have an air defense system. And so many of the missiles that Russia aims at us, they're shot down. All right, but the main, but 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 the point of it is that Putin has no problem killing his own people and making his own people suffer. Same thing with Trump. There are plenty of white people who support Trump, but they're incredibly poor. And I know this because in my job as a journalist, I went to West Virginia, which is one of the strongest pro-Trump, um, you know, uh, states in the, in the country. And I'm not trying to offend people's political sensitivities. I'm just giving you facts. Um, they have one of the highest uh, opioid addiction rates in the country. And you have, you know, and it's going back to the whole thing with Putin and the behaviors are similar. They're one of the highest opioid rates in the country, one of the highest poverty rates in the country. And I'm not trying to be funny, but I went to, I, I never saw, I never believed, I never could conceive that I could see a white person that, that uh, I could see a white person that could be as poor as the people that I saw. It is extreme poverty that reminded me of growing up in the hood. And my point is that these people vote for people who do not invest in their economic interests. Same thing with Putin. And so when you look at what Putin is doing to Ukraine and the, and, the, and the murder and the atrocities that are happening. He doesn't care because he does it to his own people in his own way. And well, so- That, that yeah. kind of sets up this next question from Ron Newman. Um, he says that the Soviet Union for years supported anti-racist and liberation movements in South Africa and other places. Has the Russian government and the Russian people totally repudiated that legacy today? That's another good question. So now I wish my colleague Kimberly Varna, um, uh, St. Julian Varna was here. She's a historian. She can answer. She's more qualified than me to answer that question, but I'll give you, I'll put you in the right direction. Um, Kimberly St. Julian Varna, you can follow her on Twitter, historian. She's great with that question. Again, I'll put you in the right direction. The reality of it is that it's a very complex question. So when you look at, you know, so when you think about 1917, the first real engagement with the continent of Africa, um, you know, experimenting with it came forth in the 19, roughly about the late 1920s, 1930s, and the end roles was through education. And so this started in the 30s. Now, the big boom happened during the decolonization of Africa during the late 1950s. And so the Soviets, I'll tell you the Soviets, in my view, actually had a good ideology. And so remember that they were coming from the Tsarist period where they looked at the Tsars as just getting fat off of the, you know, off, off the peasants' grain, basically, right? And so once the Tsars got out, or they were, no, they were killed. Let's just say it correctly. They were, I mean, they were murdered, you know, they were murdered. Um, the Soviets, had a narrative of class justice and race justice 
and some of it was true, right? So, so let's talk about the complicated. This is some of it was true. So, if you are a black person in America, you graduated from Tuskegee University, you graduated from Alabama A and M, and I think it was called something else back in those days. But anyway, I'll get my point. Or North Carolina A and T, and you had a bachelor's degree in agriculture, some type of agricultural trade. And the white man said, you, we will never hire you to do this work. And, it's so, and some Soviet um, recruiter comes over and says, we'll give you an apartment in Moscow or we'll give you some nice place in Tashkent in Uzbekistan and we will pay you double what the white man makes in America. That's going to sound appealing to you. Now, this didn't happen. Now, they didn't just get Black people in mass numbers, but they got a sizable enough people to put them on newspapers, you know, the front pages of their newspapers. And if you went over to the Soviet Union, you did experience. I mean, that's the whole, that's the complication behind it. And so now you had to deal with Stalin's tyranny because at one point, Black people became a part of the foreign, you know, scare. But generally speaking, you know, the Soviets did things like, hey, in, in, in the USSR, Black men can go to socials with our Russian women and there's not a problem. And the reality of it, it was, you know, generally speaking, you didn't have to worry about being lynched. Okay. And then also, you had work and you had opportunities to live a quality of life that you could not live in an oppressive Jim Crow South. That aspect of it is true, and we have to recognize that. Now, did, now the another now that I could talk about this all day, and Kimberly could too. But the issue, but the main thing about it is that the number one problem with the Soviets was that they were never able to overcome their Slavicness, because for all the comforts that the few black people who did go over to the Soviet Union have they were never intended to grow in large numbers. They were supposed mm -hmm. to get their education, um, or in the case in the 1930s, the Soviets um, became officially recognized by, by the United States, 1932, 33, something like that. And so the black people went over agricultural specialists and they had skills that the Soviets needed. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is that they weren't expected to be over there long-term and create babies, you know, and, and, and populate their, their society with these Black people. And so they did experience racism there because they were not fully integrated into society. In many respects, they were used as showpieces. That part yeah. is also true. And so I think people in, in the history and the conversation, people have a hard time balancing the difference between the two. And so it's not so much that, this, that, that the current Russian society has rejected this, it's just, it, it was always a political uh, measure against the U.S. that was not based on its own internal sincerity. Okay, that was very well put. Thank you so much for that. We have a, a question from anonymous attendee. <laughs> what, question, what opinions have you heard about what negotiations Ukrainians are wishing would happen to end the violence slash war? So... Today there are some there there are some meetings in uh in, in Turkey in Ankara and so basically here's the thing that the it's very difficult to believe anything on the Russian side. So what's happening? So so one of the things that the the Russians want is for Ukraine to promise that they will never join NATO. And that is some, you know, that they would be a neutral country. You know, uh, there would be a neutral country like Finland. And that's something that Zelensky is willing to offer. Because Putin's, the reason why he, the reason why Putin decided to invade, you know, to invade Ukraine, it was based on a lie saying that NATO was a threat. The reality is that this is not a NATO country. And if he was worried about NATO, he would attack a NATO country. Right. That wasn't a problem. He, he just lied. And so what so he wants Ukraine to not join NATO, but the re, but but and Ukraine is willing to concede that. But he also wants 
Ukraine to accept, you know, Ukraine to accept Crimea and the Luhansk and Donbass region as officially part of Ukraine, or at minimum some kind of autonomous status, which is something that the Ukrainians are not necessarily willing to do. Um, and so there are some, so we're hearing that on one end, the, the negotiations are, they're moving towards an agreement without necessarily solidifying it in writing, right? Okay. But, but, the, but the problem is that during negotiations in the past, bombing still took place. And another thing that they said, which I find kind of funny, and it's not funny, but given what happened is that the Russians are saying, we are not going to devote our military operations to Kyiv and Kharkiv as a sign of good faith. And the reason why they're not doing that is because they've had more than 10,000 of their troops killed and their bodies are on the streets and they don't want to send them home because the, the, the mothers calling their son's cell phones and not getting a response are going to know that their boys are dead. Mm -hmm. and, and, and most, and interesting enough, going back to the race question, a large percentage of these people who are being, coming, who are being sent here to slaughter are from the South Caucasus and from Muslim populations the ethnic Russians of the South, because a lot of the names in these local hospitals mm -hmm. are, from, are, 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 are from regions in the South where the populations are predominantly Muslim. That's enlightening. I wanna yeah. make sure I ask you this question from uh, Monica Arena Garcia. She says, hi, Terrell. Afro-Ukrainian here and a huge fan of yours. Many Westerners have a hard time understanding us or knowing we exist. Can you talk about your experiences of Afro-Ukrainians eth ethnically or nationally in Ukraine and the way they view their homeland in all of this? Many people have a hard time seeing what they saw in the media at the Polish borders and have a hard time understanding how we view ourselves. Well, thank you very much for that question. Um... My closest friends in Ukraine are Black Ukrainians. And I've, in fact, <clears throat> there are two of them I helped uh, recently this week. And I'm going to Poland on Friday. And this weekend, I'm going to meet um, my, 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 my really close friend, Tia Darina, who's a Black Ukrainian woman. Um, she's flying in from Paris. We're going to meet each other in Warsaw. Um, the Black Ukrainian conversation is a very complex one because one, she, you're correct that there are a lot of people who don't think that Black Ukrainians exist over here, which is odd because Black people are everywhere, right? Um, we may not be everywhere like we are in Mississippi or Chicago, but we're everywhere. And I think the reason why you don't hear so much about Black Ukrainians is that their their names they're not really sought after because and that goes back to you know in, in western media in fact i'm working on a project now where i'm going to be interviewing black ukrainians for a series of you know, a video series that i'm working on so you look out for that in the next two to three weeks but um i think that it's difficult for people to understand because if you're a foreign correspondent for example and you mm -hmm. come here Many people establish close ties with other journalists. That's the first thing. They're mostly white. And many of them don't really have a context of seeking out people who are different from them. When I came to Ukraine, the first people I saw were Black people. That's what I do. I look for all the Black people. And um, I'm going to see if I can pull up a photo. But basically, when I come here, when I, and, and when I first came here during my Fulbright, I... Um, I have what they call the mulatto parties. I know it sounds offensive to some people in the States, but mulatto um, yeah, is, a, is a, huh? What's that? It's a, you know, it's a way that black people here in Ukraine refer to themselves, you know, so mulat, mulat, mulat in Russian, you know, and so um, it's a very common way that people refer to themselves. And so I would have these parties at my place 
every month. And I took pride in saying that I had the highest concentration of black people in Kiev at one at any given time, you know, than any other place, you know. So um, but basically, I think the main thing is if I were a foreign correspondent with the New York Times, for example, you would see those voices in the stories. Or if I was a correspondent with CNN, those voices would be in the stories. But because you don't see a lot of these people being centered and sought out in um, in national, you know, in, in national media, national stories, then you're not going to think that they are actually here. And so, okay. so I think, so I think basically that is one of the reasons. Oh, by the way, here, here it is. Got it. Oh, that's beautiful. Hey, people. <laughs> Yeah, so so those are black Ukrainian, well, with the exception of me, obviously, but all those people are black Ukrainian. We could be friends. <laughs> I mean, again, like you look at them, they look like, you know, walking down the street, you wouldn't know they're from Ukraine, but yeah. But yeah, that's just one. Um, actually, I'm not in this photo. Um, and I and yeah, so but those are black Ukrainian people, and so um they definitely are here. Many of them are my friends, and I think. We don't talk about they're not there's also a lack of diversity in the russia east european eurasia field mm -hmm. and again you have other black people like kimberly who i brought up it's like literally two black people. and i wish i could think of other names but it's just hard you know hard but basically yeah. um you have if you if there is more diversity in this field you would know more about them because again like we naturally seek each other out and mm -hmm. i think that in too many cases white journalists naturally don't seek us out and that, that that plays a lot with it and then your you know because when you think about what's the ukraine perspective you don't look at for somebody that looks like us and that's and that's and that's the the and that's the flaw of thinking of the people who are deployed here and it has nothing to do with the local populations because you're missing out when you don't bring in their perspective because it's vastly different yeah from a lot, yeah that kind of goes to my next question. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I pulled this quote from you. Um, I think this was in the political story where you uh, said that it's the consumer's responsibility to curate their media. Um, you said, I'm one type of journalist. And so to me, that just kind of like hit on the whole notion of media literacy and the need for audience members to be able to discern information sources, including the people who are bringing them the news. So could you tell us a little bit more about, <laughs> excuse me, the responsibility to, to curate? Yes. So one of the things that we don't, that we've never learned, there are a lot of things that we don't learn in schools, including civics and how to, how, how to um, budget our money, um, health, how to, um, and, and one of the things is learning how to verify information, learning how to recognize your biases and learning how to look at news sources, right? So for example, um, the thing about social media is a gift and a curse. And I say this as somebody who's very invested in social media, I first, became a journalist during the cusp of the digital age and the analog age mm -hmm. where, and that was about 2007, 2008, mm -hmm. right? You know, you have Facebook, all these, all these play, all these social media platforms are in their infancy, Twitter. And so in the early 2000s, for example, we didn't have to worry about the quote unquote, uh, I'm not even going to say fake news and justify Trump's kind of, right, right. but but you know, and so so what I'm going to say, like you had the main social media outlets, uh, not social media outlets, but television outlets, despite all their failures, did a lot of the curation for us. For the lack of for the lack of diversity that network television had in all these on all these major newspapers, right? Uh, the lack of diversity that was an issue. Um, and their economic model was bad, get all that. But they curated a lot of our news. And so we didn't have to do 
the double checking and the triple checking of sources because again going back to, to the early part of my conversation how how you were determined to be a german journalist was based on where you worked mm -hmm. and so with social media you can become your own personality because you because we curate the type of audiences um, that come to us based on our personalities and we become a trusted source. And so I'm approach, I'm getting, I'm approaching 400,000 people on Twitter and they come to me because they trust me as a source, generally speaking, right? They follow you. And so this is something that's very new for us, right? Because we used to go to a network as a trusted source. Now we're going to individual people. And that's something, and social media empowers us to, hey, take advantage of that constitutional right that traditional media outlets, which basically blocked so many of us from getting opportunities, mm -hmm. you know. We get to do that for ourselves. That's very positive. And we saw it during Ferguson. I think the best use of social media came during Ferguson. Okay. With, with the, with the, you know, and I call it a murder of Michael Brown. That's what I call it. Yes. A killing, a murder of Michael Brown. Because um, I really believe that, that. That that's the legal definition of what happened. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Killed him, right? You know what I'm saying? So basically, um, so basically, yeah, because the autopsy was correct. Yeah. So basically, um, it was the people, the activists with their cell phones that was there first and was pushing the local media and the national media to not only cover this, but to tell the story in a proper way. And so social media made traditional media more accountable. That was the positive. Right. The challenge with that is who do you trust? Because that's the problem. And so many of us don't have the skills to determine who to trust, even though we really want to acquire them. And so where do you learn it? And the reality of it is that at the end of the day, social media is not incentivized to tell you not to watch someone. Yeah. Right. And so, and I'll, and I'll, you know, and I'll say this because I think it's interesting. Um, okay. Every once in a while, I watch, you know, I, I get off of foreign affairs and, um, and I watch kind of like my, my guilty pleasures. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the YouTuber Tasha K. Um, yeah. But anyway, here's a larger, so here's a larger story. There, there's a point to so you don't have to know who she is. Okay. But she, so, and this goes to YouTube culture as well. I watch a lot of YouTube and I look at these people, particularly in the celebrity realm, you don't see it so much in news, but a lot of the celebrity bloggers, I'm like, God, why haven't y'all been sued yet? Right. <laughs> because, oh, yeah, <laughs> what'd you say? They're starting to. <laughs> yeah, and, and here's the thing, because, you know, the both of us, um, the first thing we look at is, you know, if you're, you know, like, is this lawyer, or is our lawyer, going, our, is the lawyer going to come to us and say, uh, that's a problem, we need to talk about this? Because especially, you know, when you start dealing with things like um, the subject matters, if we're dealing with sexual assault, for example, we have, we have um, sessions with the company, we had with the company lawyer when I was working in newsrooms, mm -hmm. telling us what we could say, what we couldn't say. If we're dealing with somebody who's a survivor, we say, okay, we basically, the story becomes a legal document. That's what the lawyers train you to believe, right? But that's my journalism training that tells me, that, that, that instructs me to have that type of rigor. A YouTuber who has a million followers who can literally say, I think um, Cardi, you know, Cardi B has, some venereal disease, which is a true story. This has actually happened, and Cardi B sued the person. Yes, and won. And, and won, big time, right? But the, I'm bringing this back to you because 
the re unfortunately this person is getting all these media this media attention. I mean, she's getting all these subscribers because they don't care if she's telling the truth or not. They just want to be entertained. Yeah. And that goes back to the business model. The biz the business model does not incentivize any of us to, you know, does not incentivize social media to tell people not to watch someone because it's bad for business. And right. that deals with these larger issues with, you know, with, 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 um, with people who infiltrate social, you know, Facebook example, and you get all these shares, it's bad for business. So it's like, so there's a capitalism underpinning all of this, that, that, and that one that does not encourage people who have the capacity to teach us how to um, dissect news, but it's also with us where the bandwidth of all this stuff is just too much for us. And so we end up kind of learning as we go and, and, and you know, you make mistakes as you go. I'm yeah. sorry to answer such a long question, but it's a thing it, I'm kind of passionate about. It's big and complex and something that we confront as journalists every day. So thank you for taking the time to delve into it. I just have to say that, um, I, I cannot believe that this is your life, but I'm so thankful that it is because of the way that you are able to bear witness with your cell phone, with your with your stick walking down the street or whatever it is you're, you're doing and how you're doing it. And I just want to thank you for your generous time with us here today. And I know that everyone in the audience um, prays for your safety and the people that um, that you're working with and, and helping. And, and we just wish you the best with everything, Terrell. Thank you, I appreciate that. I appreciate everyone taking time, uh, their schedule to listen to me. And I'm also happy that I don't hear any explosions. I mean, I didn't hear one, that's which is very good. <laughs>